what what else are we going to do with this whole business? We have to know what things are. That was what that problem was about. We used a particular property density in order to identify the element gold. So I'm going to continue to do things like that. Now you also see I have another star. Whenever I have a star, it means I'm going to refer to something else or I'm going to be writing out a problem. But this one, I'm going to show you another picture. And this one is also in your book and is figure 1.2. This particular figure shows you things about matter. Because we can look at all sorts of matter and we can try to purify it, okay? So if we're gonna purify it, we have to separate things. And the first thing to do is to use physical processes to separate it. Why physical? Because physical ones aren't going to change things. Okay, so if I have an object, maybe I can separate it by a physical process. Okay, great. If I can, that means it was a mixture. And then I can say, is it uniform? throughout? Well, if it is, then it's homogeneous. And if it isn't, it's heterogeneous. And at that point, I might have something that I can separate further. Salad dressing, as you well know, unless you shake it, will separate. The oil rises and the vinegar goes to the bottom. If it's homogeneous, it may be a mixture, but it doesn't separate on its own. Vinegar is not pure acetic acid. It's about 5% acetic acid but you can't separate it by a physical process. You'd have to go to a chemical process to get them apart. Can't just shake it. Shaking is very mechanical, it's very physical. On the other hand, you could come over here and say, well, I can't separate it with a physical process, so I think it's a pure substance. Now, as a pure substance, it could either be a pure element, which means you can't decompose it with a chemical reaction because it's already pure, like the gold. Or, well, yes, I could change it with a chemical reaction. Well, then it must have been a compound. So like in this case, they put an ice cube because that's an easier thing to take a picture of than a glass of water because you might think the glass was the important part and not the water. And so it's a compound. It's made out of more than one element. And if you work at it, you can separate it into its constituent elements. We use properties to identify things. So what sort of uh, properties are there? Well, first of all, physical ones. The physical properties, you can identify the material without changing it into something else. You should always try to identify with physical properties first because it won't degrade your sample. Your sample still remains. You've still got that same sample. It hasn't been changed in any way. Density. Okay, we just did an example of that. Color. Well, the reason we thought it might be gold to begin with was because it was a golden color, but that wasn't enough. Sometimes you have to combine these things. So we used the color and we said, oh, well, it could be gold or it could be a uh, fool's gold. Let's go on and use a different one. Then melting point, because you might change the phase of it, but you haven't changed how things are attached together, how the different atoms are attached together. Water in ice is still H2O, water in liquid form is still H2O, and water as a gas is still H2O. Now, if any of you have any uh, relatives who are rock hounds, you might have heard of the Mohs scale for minerals because that's one of the ways that they try to identify what mineral they found when they pick up a random piece of rock and they're like, oh, well, gee, it's kind of green. Looks like it should have some sort of copper in it. But, you know, you could say, well, I think it might be turquoise, but then you, you do this hardness test, and you find out it's too soft, and you're, you're like, oh, it's not actually turquoise. It just has the same color as turquoise, for example. But you still haven't destroyed it. It's just that you were checking for hardness. This is the same scale that they use if that whenever you hear someone say that diamond is the hardest mineral on the planet. That's what they're referring to is this Mohs scale because diamond will scratch anything else. On the other hand, we can use chemical properties to identify something as well. But when we do that, we're using a chemical process and that means it is going to be changed in some way. And that's why we always 
use the physical properties first before the chemical ones because we are going to destroy our sample in the process of looking at the chemical properties. So, boy, we have some listed here. The reduction oxidation potential. What the heck is that? Well, that has to do with electrochemistry, and you'll learn about that later. Solubility. Oh, solubility. What's that doing in here? Because it sure seems like a lot of times you can dissolve something, and then you can just dry it back out again and get it back. But you know what? Not always. Sometimes it actually just plain reacts with the water. So solubility ends up being here in the chemical portion. Is it corrosive? Well, if it's corrosive, it is physically reacting with something else. An acid corrodes something by reacting with it, whether it will burn or not. So these are things that help you identify what something is. So when we get into, you know, you saw the little graphic about classifying something as a compound or a mixture and so on and so forth. The important things are that compounds are always the same. This composition is the same all the time. Mixtures, they're going to be different, okay? You can mix sand with salt and you can have a lot of questions. Well, how much sand versus how much salt? Lots of different possibilities. So the compounds, we talked about water, H2O, two H's for every L, two hydrogens for every oxygen. Okay. Mixtures, well, again, they can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. If we were mixing sand and salt, we could actually see the difference. If we look really closely, we could say, oh, I see that is a little grain of salt. This is a little bit of sand, and you can observe that. Homogeneous, well, they're either very well mixed so that it's the same all the time. Sometimes the things that you buy in the store are a mixture, but you consider them homogenous. They're the same all the way through. If you buy a loaf of bread, you don't expect one side of the loaf of bread to be extremely doughy and the other side to be extremely crispy. You expect the bread to be the same all the way through. So that would be well mixed in a single phase. And you can't tell the difference from one side of the bread to the other, even with a microscope, okay? So homogenous versus heterogeneous. And when we're separating mixtures, you know, we mentioned that there are various properties that we could observe. What about the actual methods? We're going to just do a small example then. If I had a bucket that was filled with stones and sand and salt and water, how would I manage to recover those, each of them separately, okay? I don't want to change them. When I'm done, I want separate the stones, the sand, the salt, and the water. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Here are a few separation techniques, okay? Distillation will let you separate things based on their boiling points. So you can even separate two different liquids this way because one will have a different boiling point than the other. There's decanting, which uses density. Okay, so decanting. You might have heard of a piece of glassware called a decanter. A decanter has a particular shape to it, which I am now going to draw, all right? So a decanter usually has a rather bulbous shape on the bottom of it, okay? So there it is, it's got some stuff in it. What do I do when I pour it out? Well, when I pour it out, it's gonna go sideways, right? So I got it sideways like this. And I can pour out the liquid. Now, if there are any little bits of stuff, they won't come out easily because of the shape. And so a decanter is specifically shaped this way because back in the old days when they made wine, they didn't have the ability to filter it very well. And so you'd often end up with little bits of stuff here that's like grape skin that was left over and hadn't gotten filtered out of the wine because they weren't using fancy filters like they do now. So. This would be a way of not ending up with it in your wine glass. Instead, it would be caught in the decanter. And so we use that idea to separate things. And so we can decant. We can also go to filtration. 
you know, there's no filter here. You're just pouring it out. But here you could actually pour it through something and catch all the items. And this works very well when this is very microscopic and it's hard to decant it because it isn't very heavy in comparison as well to the water. If the densities are very similar, it won't uh, settle out very well. So you would use a filtration to do that. And then here is chromatography, which depends on the fact that different molecules will adsorb, stick to the filter paper easier than others will. So they won't travel as far because they end up getting stuck to the paper and they don't continue to travel. Okay, that's rather interesting. I'm sure the first time that this was discovered was somebody who was doing a filtration and they're like, wait a minute, my filter paper is different colors along it, not uniform. And they're like, what's going on there? And they said, you know what, maybe we could use this to help us understand what's going on too. So in the case of our bucket, right? And it's got big stones and it's got little sand and it's got salt and water, which means, oh, the salt is dissolved in the water. So what would I do? Well, I could just use a large sieve and pour the whole thing through and that would catch the big stones. This would have really wide openings in it. It would let the sand through, but not the stones. This is a really bad filter, <laughs> right? It's got big holes in it, so it's a bad filter, but it gets the stones out. So yay, I've got one of my items has been separated and that's a totally physical method. So the next thing I would do is I would use a good filter that will let only things that are liquid go through. So that means the sand is gonna be left behind. Yay, I have gotten two of the three. Now I'm stuck with a bunch of salt water. If I didn't care whether I got the water back, I could simply boil it. If I did that, I could get the salt, but I would lose the water as steam to the atmosphere, which is why instead, we would use distillation. We would distill it, which allows us to catch the water and catch the steam, let it recombine to form the liquid water. And so that would be the preferred method if I want to get everything back. This wouldn't get everything back, but using distillation, we could get everything back.